Please pray with me. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be accepted in your sight. You, Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So, speaking of differences, um, there are things that we like and dislike that are different from other people, right? Sometimes, especially with those that are closest to us. So my husband and I were talking about this in the car yesterday, and he gave me an example, and I got excited and thought, I'm going to look up and see how many other people, you know, what are the things that people argue about at home? And so uh, just to share a few of those, I'm going to start with the great toilet paper debate. <laughs> Over or under? All right? How many of you have had that conversation in your family? Yeah, some of us have. Or maybe the uh, seat up or down conversation. Um, although there really is a right answer to that, I'm just going to say. Um, whether you squeeze the toothpaste from the middle or from the bottom. And I was struck as looking at the list as to how many of our difficulties actually occur in the bathroom. <laughs> um, but time spent on the golf course. But honey... When I spend time on the golf course, I can come back and give you my full attention. <laughs> or, uh, why do you have to have so many shoes? Honey, I have to have something to match all my outfits. Now, these are some fairly silly uh, disagreements uh, when it really comes down to it and when we really think about it, not things that truly matter in our lives. But there are other things that we disagree on when it really comes to the point. And some of these things may seem to have no solution either. For instance, which candidate should we vote for? How much should the federal government or any government level really regulate or dictate on issues such as taxes or women's reproductive choices? Or what God has to say about certain readings or interpretations or theological understandings about scripture? These are things that we disagree on and sometimes seems like we have no commonality. But this is not a sermon about these specific issues. I promise you, we're not going to go there today. This is a sermon about division, which is also in our gospel today and also still exists in today's world and culture. The point of my examples, all of them, is that we disagree on things. And then we fight about them especially when those disagreements come to our core values or deep theological convictions. We fear that if someone else believes differently than us on one thing, they must also disagree with us on other core values. The thing is, we're often arguing in those arguments about the how, but we're not truly arguing about the bigger picture of why. Let me give you an example of some of a, an argument that took place on social media that I watched. And it was a while back um, after a school shooting, and it was about um, the great gun debate. Um, Jane was voting, or was uh, arguing that there needs to be much more regulation, that nobody needs guns, that we need to be very clear about who can and can't have them and have much stricter regulations. And John is saying, actually, more people need them to protect others, and especially in the schools, if teacher wants, teachers want to have guns, they should have them so that they can um, fight off an intruder in a more helpful way. When it really comes down to it, though, both people want our children to be safe. That's the bigger issue. We fight about the how, but we forget about the why, and so it becomes this heated debate instead of really sitting down to solve a critical problem. In our gospel today, the leaders of the temple in Jerusalem have come down to observe what's going on with Jesus. Um, and they determine in their observation that Jesus must be filled with the devil because he's casting out demons and the demons are obeying his commands. This is probably because they don't understand or believe that he is the son of God. Even Jesus' family thinks he's a little out of his mind for doing what he's doing that day. So Jesus, ever the calm arbitrator, um, and this actually, when I think about calm arbitrator, the, the guy that plays Jesus in the Chosen series, I love it because whenever there's this big conflict and there's a whole bunch of tension going on, 
he just gets this little sparkle of mischievousness in his eyes, and it's like, bring it on. I just love it. He never strays from the conflict. And in fact, in this story today, instead of saying, no, you're wrong. Of course, I'm full with the Holy Spirit. I'm not, I don't have demons. You're wrong. Instead, he just calls them to himself, and he shares stories with them. He uses parables to show that their question really has more than one right answer or maybe one wrong answer, and also to explain the division that they're experiencing. Clifton Black of Princeton Theological Seminary clarifies this use of the parable. Um, of course, Jesus is casting out. They believe him to have the devil with him. Um, and, and Clifton says Jesus' parable is a little bit tricky. But Jesus claims in verses 23b through 26 that Satan's house is as susceptible to division as any other house in this world. And so this causes a conundrum for the leaders. They're a little confuzzled, right? It's an awkward spot for them because if they deny what he's saying, if they deny that, a G, that Satan's house is susceptible to division then they're thrown at odds with the basis of their accusations. In other words, if he is Satan, then he can't cast out Satan, or the whole house or rule of Satan would crumble. But if they accept Jesus' argument, they end up agreeing with him, contradicting their indictment of him. In other words, Jesus could break in and command them because he has Satan under his control. Either way, they can't be right. But in the end, I think Jesus' question isn't about who's right or wrong with this particular uh, issue. The real question is, why are the leaders so worried about what Jesus is doing and how he's doing it in the first place? Because as much as we love to jump to conclusions about the leaders of the Jewish people at that time, the, 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 the honest truth is that they loved God that they loved the people, that they wanted people to keep their faith. They wanted to keep their faith, and this was all because they loved God. Which is, in fact, as we know, what the followers of Jesus want, too. So Jesus, instead of getting baited into the wrong argument, where no one wins, confuses the question with an answer that goes against them either way. The bottom line is, if the leaders had been curious about what he was doing and why he was doing it, rather than judgmental and argumentative about what he was doing, then they may have realized they're actually on the same side. And this could have led perhaps to a deeper discussion of who Jesus is and what he has come to do. But of course, this is the problem, isn't it? How hard would it be for us to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. If someone walked in this door and came up this aisle today and said, I am the Son of God, watch this, we'd be like, got a few questions, right? It's hard. But then again, even if you couldn't believe him, you could see that on a regular basis, in all these miracles and all of these healings and so on, he never took the credit himself, but always gave credit to God who was working through him, who has sent him. He often even kept people from saying anything about what had happened. And I like to think that that was because he could have a chance then to talk to people in person. If, if people went away and told people far away, he wouldn't have that chance to sit down and talk with people in person. And, 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 and they would make these judgments from afar about what they thought was happening. And he couldn't show his true self to them. God couldn't reveal his true self to them through Christ. Again, I say, though, the point is that even in our closest communities, such as our family, we are susceptible to break down from disagreement. But Jesus has come to remember us. Jesus has come to help us remember to look for the why in people rather than jump to conclusions. Jesus has come to teach us how to love. Now, does this mean that we will all of a sudden one day have the same core values and gifts and ideas 
and likes and dislikes and preferences. Of course not, no, because we're all created differently, so we all have our different life experiences, we all have our different opinions, we're all in different places on our journey, and therefore our thoughts on how things should be done and what will work best are going to be different. But Jesus teaches us, however, that these differences don't have to divide us. Jesus teaches us to love first, to listen first, to look for the why first, to assume the best in a person first, and to treat people with love in return. Division is difficult, but our differences don't have to be. We may all be different here. Like at APLC, we may have our different opinions, our different votes, our different philosophies. But we all come together because God loves us. And in our families, we may have the same issue in the world. But because of Christ, we all have a place and we all belong and we are all enough. And when we love one another, despite our differences, and surrender our division to Christ, Christ does remember us. Christ does bring us back together as one people of faith. Amen.